Welcome to Faith of Politics, a show dedicated to discussing issues surrounding the intersection of church, state, and politics, and the examination of whether you're allowing your faith to shape your politics, or are your politics starting to shape your faith? In other words, what do you do when God and government come face to face? I'm your host, Orlin Johnson. Let me introduce you to our guest panelists that we have today. We have Mr. Todd McFarland, Deputy General Counsel for the World Seventh-day Adventist Church, we have Ms. Melissa Reed, who's the Director of Government Relations for the North American Division of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We have Mr. Rashern Baker, who's the President and CEO of the Baker Strategy Group and a University of Maryland Professor of Public Policy. And we have Dr. Nia Johnson, who's the Visiting Assistant Professor at Duke School of Law. Great to have you guys here with us and looking forward to our conversation for today. You know, it seems that there's an issue regarding the Balancing Act as it relates to religious dignity that's happening on a worldwide basis. You know, as the Muslim population has grown, for example, in recent decades, Europe has sought to try to defend its core democratic principles, such as the freedom of speech, religious liberty, and while embracing it and expanding the cultural diversity. Now, that challenge has really been kind of vividly on display where in the Danish government, they had to introduce a bill in parliament to ban public desecration of religious objects. You know, these measures were basically put in place to stop individuals from burning the Quran, which is Islam's most sacred text. There've been other actions regarding some pushback in terms of Muslim clothing that are being banned and things of that nature. What we are starting to see is that countries that actually have a code that have a lot of secularisms are struggling with these changes that are taking place, in particular when we see immigrant communities moving that way. You know, Todd, you're somebody who's been involved in a lot of cases regarding religious freedom, not just here in the United States, but across the globe. But ironically, we are starting to see that this question regarding religious dignity is struggling as we start to see countries, even a country like Denmark that's considered to be fairly kind of like, you know, neutral in terms of, you know, religious freedom, secular in some ways, but people are actually burning the Quran and banning Muslim clothing. Is this something that we in the US need to be thinking about? And is this a voice that probably looks like it may be not that unusual as we move forward in time? Well, I, you know, Europe has a very different history than the United States does on both religion and free speech. Um, Europe has been much more comfortable with restricting uh, speech for a number of reasons, including lack of a, a First Amendment type protections, which, which uh, you know, the United States had well and before. You also has to be informed by Europe's response to the Second World War which outlawed a lot of what was viewed, well, what not viewed as, but what was anti-Semitic uh, comments and speech. <clears throat> as a result of that, what has happened as Muslims have immigrated to Europe is they have tried to implement sort of some of what they consider to be comparable protections. The difference, of course, is you don't have the same uh, history with Jews in Europe as you do with Muslims in Europe. It also raises questions about whether these are the appropriate sort of responses. The answers you'll get is, listen, all you know, genocide or attacks, and you can go back to Rwanda and other more recent, has started with speech and started with speech that's anti-particular religion. And therefore, the idea is, well, let's cut that off you know, at the sort of beginning. The challenge with that, of course, is the line between a person protesting Islam and saying that they don't agree with it, which is absolutely should be a protected uh, speech, and then how they do that. Do we really want to have the government saying, well, it's fine to criticize Islam, but you can only do it in these particular ways. Mm. And sometimes criticism by organizations or other organizations that we would find distasteful is how it, people feel like they need to get the attention of society. So these, these, I think, uh, challenges reflect a particular European history. Um, whether you would see that uh, sort of restriction in the United States, that would be hard under current law. Well, Nia, when I look at France sending home hundreds of schoolgirls because they were wearing Muslim garb as they went to school, and there was something that was saying that that was violating the country's code of secularism. You know, when I start seeing that type of conversation, I mean, it reminds you of certain things that we've seen in other parts of the world and even here in the United States from time to time. But when the focal point seems to be on religion, that's where I think, you know, it starts to give us a feeling of we're a little concerned with this. 
Yeah, you know, just like piggybacking off of um, Todd's point of like doing a little bit of table setting here. I mean, we also have to be, you know, a little bit more in touch with the role, the intersection of ethnicity, racism, and xenophobia in a lot of these conversations about religion and how religion can kind of be the umbrella that we hold a quote-unquote other group underneath. And so what we're seeing a little bit here in Europe is that, you know, when you have certain mechanisms, as Top was saying, that already exist in place, naturally, when you immigrate to that country, you do have to figure out, okay, how do we protect ourselves underneath the framework that's already there? Because to make a complete shift in, you know, the principles of a country, it's quite difficult to do. And I think we could say that applies whether you're in the U.S. context or whether you're in the European context. And so you have, you know, folks who are looking for certain protections around religion or the Danish government trying to create protections around religion. When we actually may be talking a little bit more about race and race and ethnicity, it's very ironic that you brought up um, France, who has also had very, um, you know, an extensive amount of issues with anti-blackness and racism, um, you know, and xenophobia as well. That has also been tied really neatly to religion. And so parsing apart the two of those is really challenging. And then the last thing that I'll say is that I think we're going to see more of this in Europe as we see more immigration due to the fact that many of these nations that are struggling with this have been historically very homogeneous. And that is one of the ways that they have differed from the United States, given that the United States has come into lands that were owned by what are now minority people, um, have, you know, imported, you know, minority people for chattel slavery, etc. The composition of the United States has never been homogeneous racially, ethnically, or otherwise, right? Like we've like, you know, redone PR to say like we're the country of immigrants. Like, you know, this is why we have so much friction now as we talk about heterogeneity in the United States and how it shows up in politics. But in other countries, especially in Europe, there is a little bit more homogeneity. And so we are seeing, you know, the like countries like, um, like, or governments like the Danish government, like France trying to figure out, okay, how do we integrate these people while also protecting them? And so in this case, you're seeing it, um, you know, looking at free speech as an opportunity to maybe constrain some of the hate speech or what can be perceived as hate speech happening in those countries. You know, Melissa, when you see some of these things, it almost reminds us of a case we dealt with with Abercrombie versus Abercrombie and Fitch case where we were dealing with a matter of a Muslim woman being told that you couldn't work there because your hijab did not match their looks policy. And on one hand, you would be like, well, that sounds like something we would have seen in Europe, but it doesn't sound like we're really that far away from this. Yeah, and, and that's why I think, you know, I appreciate Todd and, and Nia both sort of putting this into context. And, and one other thing I'll add, and I'm specifically talking to the, the Danish or the uh, government as well, is we had in 2006 in, De in Denmark real backlash because of some political cartoons that were published, uh, backlash by the Muslim community. Um, you know, that depicted the Prophet Muhammad in a way that was very offensive to that community. And as a result of that situation, there was then a blasphemy clause uh, put into the federal mm -hmm. uh, uh, code of statutes there. And so that that piece of legislation or that clause was repealed in 2017. And what we're seeing now with the Danish government is they're taking real pains to say, hey, you know, our country is continuing to experience these growing pains as these population groups that uh, that both Nia and Todd have described are, are merging together. Uh, and we want to try to make that happen as seamlessly and as um, and organically as possible. And so they took, as I said, real great pains in, in saying that this proposed piece of legislation or, or change was very, very narrow. It only dealt with uh, burning the Quran in public. It didn't deal with print. It didn't deal with, you know, illustrations, all of these sort of things. So they were trying to maintain that free speech, uh, pr those free speech protections, but at the same time wanting, it seems like, um, from my reading, to welcome this population group that is uh, that has been immigrating in, in record numbers uh, to their country. You know, Sharon, you're on a campus where, you know, on one hand you're here in Maryland, but on the other hand, it's a tremendous amount of international students that are there. There are a lot of activities where the leadership at the university is spending time internationally and, and trying to really recruit that way as well. As we're starting to see kind of what I would call this merger of cultures that are taking place, it seems as though religion has been one of the areas where the struggle seems to be almost on the front porch. <laughs> 
No, you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the things that Todd said that is absolutely correct, and that is we have a foundation in this country about how to deal with the separation of church and state and First Amendment. Um, Dr. Johnson talked about, you know, in Europe, what's going on. She's absolutely right. In Europe, the interesting fact is they're dealing with the um, explosion of an immigration population that's coming back home. Because many of these European countries had colonized these places elsewhere and offered citizenship to many of these folks who are now coming to live in Europe when they didn't in the past. And they don't have a framework to deal with both the complexity of the various religious groups. If you think about Europe, you think about two main religious groups, whether you're Catholic or Protestant, you know, or Jewish, you know, three. Um, so all of that's coming into play in Europe at a time when they don't have a framework like our you know, First Amendment rights. And so you see the struggle there. I think the thing for us to realize in this country, when we're looking at what's going on in Europe, is that in our own country, we, we see some of the similar stuff going on here um, in our country. Take the case of the young lady in a high schooler who couldn't run and attract me because you know, she had a jabab, she had a, a headscarf, um, or anything like that. We see these cases coming up here. And um, so we have to be very mindful of not only what's going on across you know, Europe, but making sure that we have the protections in there so that there's no you know, violations of both the First Amendment, but also putting people in harm's way. Hey Todd, when you're out on the front line and you have people trying to really understand the difference between a cultural battle and a religious battle, that seems to be one of the areas where sometimes it, it starts to get blurred. On one hand, you know, it's cultural and sometimes political and it has these, you know, overtones of religion and maybe sometimes it actually is not religion at all. Uh, I mean, when you see that, and I'm sure that's something you've seen that you've bumped into, you know, how do you find yourself trying to really kind of parse those arguments to kind of separate the two? Yeah, I, you do see that. And in, in sussing out the difference between a person's religion and a person's ethnicity and these different sort of statuses they have can often be very difficult, if not impossible. And of course, talking about what is truly motivating a group of people or a country, oftentimes in which you will have different motivations for different part of it is difficult. I mean, there are certainly people in Europe who view this as primarily, you know, an issue of who's immigrating and that being the problem. There's others who are deeply concerned about loss of values. There's others that are probably deeply concerned about Islam itself. And so trying to suss that out, I think, is, is in many regards sort of a fool's errand. I think a better approach is having equal principles that allow for, for free speech, allow for people to worship in peace and safety, but don't allow them necessarily to control other people's behavior, especially if it's something they feel like simply is offensive to them. And you see everything from the Charlie Hebdo shootings to the riots that Melissa referred to, to the beheading in France back in 2020 of a teacher. And, you know, you have to ask yourself to what extent is creating expectation that you'll never be offended, sort of feeding into this sort of violence for people that just simply didn't like the message uh, that another person was giving. Orland, if I could jump in on that. I just, because I really, at that point, as far as, you know, again, looking at the Danish government and specifically, the foreign minister was talking about, you know, we are seeing these actions take, take place, these senseless taunts as referred to them in order to create discord and, and, and hatred. And again, while I applaud sort of, I think the Danish government's desire or with what they're doing, it's, I don't know that it's going to achieve uh, bringing harmony to the communities by saying that a particular act or, you know, is, is no longer available. I don't know that that is the path to, to what they're actually wanting to achieve. It seems at the, at the most like a band-aid for a situation. And I think when we look at a lot of these topics, the, the abuses can be so large and the fixes that you have to be able to put it in place can seem so small. And therefore, the whole Band-Aid concept is probably quite fitting. And I think sometimes that's what we find ourselves doing, trying to just engage in triage until we can actually get the patient where we really want it to be. You know, there's a case that's called Lowe versus Waltz. And in 1985, 
Minnesota enacted the Post-Secondary Enrollment Options Act to allow high school sophomores, juniors, and seniors to take college classes that would count for high school and college credit. The program covers the cost of tuition, required classroom materials, textbooks, and, and basically allowing students to kind of further their academic pursuits without taking on any debt. This program has been long served for high schoolers in the state and promoting rigorous academic pursuits, and, and it was for both secular and religious schools. However, we have a situation where we have a couple here who are Christian parents in Minnesota who've kind of used these funds in the past to send their children to school, and they wanted to also uphold their religious values. And two institutions in the state, the University of Northwestern and Crown College, provided their children excellent opportunities to learn in a college environment that also provided a Christian community. Both families have high school age children. They want to be in a position where they can utilize the funds. But it seems as though there's a question regarding whether you're actually going to be engaging in a Christ-centered education, that that's something that the governor wanted to see moving forward. You know, Neil, when you see a case like this, in particular when you think about it from an academic standpoint, and it looks as though funding sometimes can be available, and then there becomes this big question of, are you on the left side or the right side? And I'm not talking about politically, or are you on the religious side, or are you on the non-religious side? And then all of a sudden it gets murky, and what looks like it may be something that's on the state side, now looks like it starts to call things into question, and now we finally see that we've got this issue between what you should be doing as it relates to thousands of high high school students in Minnesota. How do we parse through these type of activities and why do we see this happening? Well, I think we're in an interesting moment where, you know, the people are looking for external opportunities to make sure that their children are being indignated with religious values. Um, I think we see this most commonly in the United States from the Judeo-Christian religions, like whether, you know, you find the side of Catholicism or Protestantism, you know, parents are putting their children in Christian spaces because they want them to absorb those values. Now, mind you, I think this also could sometimes create a little bit of friction because we are talking about children, teens who are independently minded, right? Like we can't clone children into being religious copies of ourselves. And so that does create a certain level of panic. And so you have a lot of um, individuals who are looking to the state and are looking to public resources to, on one hand, receive the benefits of having their children in some of these more well-funded spaces, um, you know, that have the opportunity, you know, to do larger things. Like maybe you want a nicer robotics program, maybe you want your kids in tech and coding, but you also want to make sure that they are not absorbing anything, quote unquote, to use a Christian phrase, like, of the world. And, and I think we have to like revisit if that's a realistic standard, not only for like, you know, the individuals themselves, um, but also for the state to have to bear, you know, like these are resources that you are opting to take advantage of, right? We, and also we do not live in a theocracy. There may be some people who want this to be a theocracy. That is also a conversation for a different show, but we do not live in a theocracy. It is not the state's job to make sure that your children remain as Christian as possible. That That is a parenting goal. That is not a public policy goal. Uh, but I think we do need to think a little bit harder about how we start parsing those apart as time goes on. You know, Todd, we see that the, st the state just decided to kind of reverse itself. It seemed like one day all is good, the next day you're not sure what's going on. Is that what really creates the biggest confusion here and why the change? Is it societal or just depends on the lay of the land politically? What have you been seeing? Well, so first of all, I, I think you're referring to the fact that the state chose not to enforce this while the lawsuit is pending. I want to be clear, uh, Beckett is handling this case, uh, Beckett uh, Legal Defense Firm. Uh, I have no involvement in this. So what I'm about to say is speculation based on other religious liberty cases I have. But I suspect the reason the state of Minnesota did that was not to create confusion or out of sense of uh, graciousness, but they probably knew they were going to lose the uh, preliminary injunction ruling from the judge, right? So you can go into court and say, listen, we're suffering immediate harm. Judge, you need to put a hold on this until you fully decide it. And I suspect that's why Minnesota caved on, on that particular part of it. And the reason they caved is that the Supreme Court has made it pretty clear that if states are passing out these benefits, they can't discriminate against religious schools. And well, as Nia pointed out, this particular case is dealing with high school students taking college credit. You have to start asking yourself, well, what is the legal principle here that if the state could deny that, then can they deny, say, a program for college students? And if they can do that, could the federal government deny things like student loans and other stuff? And the reality is because the federal government has come in and put so much money into especially the higher education space that Christian schools can't really operate unless their students can access 
that same support on an equal basis. I grew up in a very working collar, working class family. No way in the world could have I afforded an Adventist education without the benefit of, you know, student loans. And so I, it's not a matter just of the government, uh, you know, like, well, if you, you know, if you don't take the money, you have to have the restrictions is that it would push religious institutions out of the space if they weren't able to access on the same basis as everyone else. No, Sharon, you've operated in the state legislature where I imagine that these type of topics have come up, you know, and sitting on these budget and tax committees and being in leadership roles where you've been in the past. How have you seen these battles taking place from a state standpoint that sometimes eventually morph themselves into the federal levels? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I remember that we were dealing with pre-K and not having enough schools in our system, public schools, to deal with pre-K. So we turned to uh, religious schools to educate our kids. And that be turned into a really big battle as to whether we could give these um, religious schools uh, the money to operate pre-K when it, at a time when the government needed them the most. So I think you're going to see these cases go back and forth. And unfortunately, they tend to fall on the left and the right. Those who are far on the left say, oh, no, you can't do it. Those far on the right say you must do it. Rather than looking at, as I did as a legislator, from a practical standpoint, can we make, how do we get the best education, the best opportunities for our kids with the least intrusive amount? So, and this is probably what they're struggling in Minnesota. You want this opportunity for their children to get a better education, to be better prepared and help parents out. And now you run into someone who's complained and say, well, are we, are we promoting religion rather than we're promoting education? And so I think we have to be very careful um, as to how we approach it from a legislative standpoint, which is really what this is about. This is the public policy um, in areas where we want to make sure. And I said this when I was county executive that we both supported, you know, uh, secular uh, schools that were helping our kids. And we promoted, you know, religious schools that were helping our kids, giving our our parents the best opportunity and options for their children. And I think we have to be very careful with that. You know, Orlin, you mentioned that the governor, uh, the uh, governor's office had done sort of a reversal on this situation. And, and, you know, so we're looking at this program that's been in place since 1985 with, with religious schools, be, uh, not, not just participating, but one of the plaintiffs in the case actually has logged the most credit hours of any other institution in the state with yeah. its participation previously. So it's not a minor situation. It would, as Todd mentioned, dramatically affect the ability for students to be able to attend that school and the school probably, if, if we're looking at the, the um, sort of the retention rate of those that, that um, join, and I think they said what, 40% of high school students that participate then go on to that institution of higher learning to for their college degree. So it could really impact uh, that school's existence, viability. So I was very curious, and I was, what was the motivation by the governor's office to make this change for something that's been in place for several decades? I couldn't find anything. I, I don't know if any of the other panelists found anything either, but I was very curious what the motivation had been there. Well, I can, I can almost guess right away what the motivation was. Someone in the legislature complained that we're promoting religion, and therefore you have a liberal governor you know, good governor, I think. And that complaint led to the other things. That's normally how it happens. We have a program where we were actually giving um, funding for Jewish schools in Baltimore City that were doing great work. Mm -hmm. And it was it was in place for about eight years until someone in the legislative body complained. And then we took a whole look at it again. So I'm willing to bet when you uh, go do some uh, digging in it, that's where it's going to come out. Um, I was going to just say, you know, but I think there's some really interesting push pull here when we talk about education in the U.S. on the whole. I mean, like there also has been like a broader movement of parents shifting their children towards um, pub, um, private education in general because they, you know, they're getting a better education. They're getting a smaller class size. And frankly, these schools are just much better resource. And when we talk about going to college, you know, in this country, that is kind of essential for employment. And so a lot of this, I think, at, at the end of the day, not only, you know, pulls on all the things that were really said 
said by the panelists that were fantastic, but also as a broader conversation about public education in general and if it's working really well. And like, you know, the need to probably pull in some of these private schools and parochial schools into or in charter schools in some cases and pull them into a public education structure that is kind of not built for so much religious collaboration, hence it being public school, right, versus the private institutions. You know, Orlin, what I was going to say before is, and this issue came up before about the issue of capacity, right? So just like Maryland stuff, you know, struggled to have enough sort of secular space for pre-K, California a few years ago had a proposal, SB 1146, that would refuse Cal grants, which are pretty significant to schools that required a statement of faith. That died in the legislature, and it died primarily not because of a love for religious liberty, but two things. One, it disproportionately would impact minorities, but two... The University of California system, which is already oversubscribed, just could not take these students. Like, if you want people to actually get an education, you can't cut out the religious schools because there just is not enough capacity. And so, you know, I don't think that should be the dispositive factor. I think these schools should have this on an equal basis. But it does show how all these different factors sort of come together uh, to, to sometimes legislatures, if they're doing their job, have to make the right decision for the students, all of the students. Well, you know, I think that's a good point, Todd, that a lot of these activities sometimes get centered on religion and funding, where at the end of the day, it's really looking like what's in the best interest of these young people being turned into productive citizens that could somewhat come back sometimes and actually assist your state in moving forward. So I think trying to always look at something from a religious perspective sometimes may be a completely different side of the coin, but we allow some of the ideologues that are having conversations to, in my opinion, just weigh us down unnecessarily. Melissa, tell me something I don't know. Okay, Orlin. So right now, Islam is the largest minority faith tradition in Denmark. We've been discussing Denmark today. It's at 4.4% of the population. Just for some context, back in 1980, there were only 30,000 Muslims living in Denmark, which is about 0.6% of the population then. Wow, Todd, tell me something I don't know. With only four terms in the United States House, the current speaker, Mike Johnson, has the least amount of experience of any speaker of the House since John Carlisle was elected in 1883. Well, I guess experience isn't critical anymore. Rashawn, tell me something I don't know. Did you know the person who's considered a, the first progressive president, Woodrow Wilson, used Judeo-Christian uh, values to turn back the clock on rights for African-Americans in this country? You saw the rise of the Ku Klux Klan under his uh, leadership and segregation uh, expand. Didn't know that. Nia, tell me something I don't know. So in light of the recent Dobbs decision, you have many states and many activists who are looking to try to enshrine some form of abortion rights within the Constitution. And so very recently, Ohio managed to enshrine abortion rights within their Constitution, even though they have typically been portrayed as a very red state. Well, that was real interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here with us. Enjoyed the conversation and the topics that we covered. Thanks again for you being here with us. Hope you enjoyed our conversation. Just remember, if it's about God and government, it's faith and politics. See you next time.